forget just to like raise our hands up and get on our knees and be like God I give this completely to you and he swoops in and he's right there the battle does belong to him and there's nothing too big for our God do you believe that I'm Crystal one of the worship leaders here and I'm so excited that you're here in person and also online thank you so much for joining us if you want to give them a shout to the online community thank you we're gonna continue just with the worship and I just want you to encourage you um, that this isn't a performance up here, this isn't a show. I love just to be in the presence of the Lord and I want to do anything I can to de decrease so God can increase and you guys can just feel his glory and his presence. And uh, the next song we're gonna sing is called Hosanna. It's kind of an, an older one. Some would say classic and um, Hosanna really means save us, save me, save us. Who knows what the one true thing that can only, only save us. It's not somebody, it's not a substance, it's not a program, but it's Jesus Christ. Can we all say that together? It's Jesus Christ. All right, so let's just give it all to the Lord this morning. Let's sing this together.
lift our voices one more time and sing Hosanna.
pray that we would say, great are you. Regardless of what's going on around us, regardless of the way our world seems to be headed, that we would fix our eyes on Jesus. God, that we would focus our eyes on your plan and on your will. And that we would say, even regardless how we feel, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, God, and we pour out our praise. God, may we be, may we be made in vessels to, to glorify the name of Jesus across our world, our family, our workplace, our homes. God, would you come and speak to us today? Would you open our ears to hear your will, your word for us? God, would you open our eyes to see what you have in store for us? And God, may we come with open hearts and minds to receive what you have for us. And we give you that praise. We say, come and have your way in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, grab a chair today. Wow, we've, we, uh, we, we packed the place out this morning. Welcome, welcome, glad to have you today. You know, I gotta tell you, as you're sitting down and walk, welcome to our online service, our first service was really low today, like 25% less than what it was normally. We have little like numbers that we have and we hold to and like, man, where'd everybody go? Y'all came here right now, so thank you. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to the 10 o'clock service for some of those nine o'clockers that are 830ers that slept in. Uh, glad to have you. Let me take a brief moment just to welcome you. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm the pastor here at Journey. And I'm just honored and, honored and privileged that we get to do what we get to do. My wife and I and a small group of people started this church a little over two years ago. And really for the last year and a half, we've been meeting in person. And just week after week, we're just so blessed by what God is doing here and what God is doing through this church. It's not us, it's truly, it's God. We give all the glory and credit to Jesus. And we just wanna say we're so honored that you chose to be with us today. If you are here today for the first time, I just wanna say welcome. We're so honored for you to be with us today. We've got a connection card in the seat in front of you, maybe, because we had to pull out a bunch of other seats. So you maybe don't have one, I don't know, but we've got a connection card that we'd love to get you to fill one of those out. Or you could text the number that uh, they had on the screen. We'll put it up later on. You can text the number. It's actually on the back of most of the seats. Uh, and we just love to just let you know, we're honored that you chose to be with us today. Of all the places on a Sunday in June that you chose to be with, you chose to be with us. And I, and I just want you to know, we're so honored for you to be with us today. I know that today is going to be a great day. We're talking about some fun, some exciting, kind of some unnerving or unsettling things in scripture today. I and you're like, okay, where are we going? What did I come to church for today? I promise it'll be good. You'll enjoy it. And uh, I know that God's got something he wants to speak into your life, some hope and some peace, some life in, into your future. We've been in a study in the book of 1 Thessalonians for the last five, six weeks. This is our sixth week in that. We've got two more weeks left in this book. And then we're gonna take a short pause in our book study. We're gonna have a couple of guest speakers and some fun summer series messages. We're gonna jump right back into first, our second Thessalonians. And really these two letters are written by, the same person, Paul the Apostle, who wrote most of the New Testament as we would understand it today. And he's writing to churches. And in these letters, as he's communicating to churches, he's communicating God's will and God's desire to each of these churches. And today, we're gonna pick up on some of those fun things. The last couple of weeks, what we've been discussing in the book of 1 Thessalonians is really what it looks like to follow Jesus Christ, what it looks like to live a life after Jesus. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, this isn't the scripture I'm putting up, but he just says, First Thessalonians, this is the will of God and your sanctification or your salvation. And he basically gives us, the church, three things that God wants us to live our lives out. The first is holiness. God asks us and requires of us to live a holy life. Holy is not like holier than thou, separated from, you know, living in a monastery. Holiness simply means set aside or useful for God's work. God wants us to set aside, be set aside from the culture and the, the, the themes of our world, particularly when it comes to sex and the way we approach that in our society today. God wants us to live a holy life to him. Secondly, God asks us to live a harmonious life, to get along. Romans says it like this, as best as possible is, is capable for you to live at peace with those around you. To not be the type of people that stir up strife or to try to stir the pot, but rather to bring peace to the world around us. And lastly, it's to live an honest life. That God has commissioned us and challenged each and every one of us to do something with this life that we've been given and to put our hands to work, to not delegate or even abdicate our responsibility as followers of Jesus to somebody else thinking that's not my job or that's not my place, but rather we step up into the work that God has called us to do. And after doing so, now Paul lays the foundation for one of the great promises of God, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. Today... If you're taking notes, if you're just writing notes down, or just even for the sake of, of, of reference back, I titled the message today, I'll Be Back. 
Okay, okay. Now, listen, I did not quote Jesus right there. Some of you know that is not what Jesus says. That is a quote of the famous Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, I gotta tell you, I was only, some of you might feel really old right now. I was only one years old when The Terminator first came out in 1984. I remember it was one of those movies that was on the absolute do not watch list for my family. Back in the day, I always wondered what The Terminator was all about. You know, we always laughed about Arnold Schwarzenegger and people quoted him all the time, like I'll be back and hasta la vista, baby. But I remember the first time I I ever saw the movie, The Terminator. See, my sister had just moved back into our house and she had The Terminator and a bunch of other do not watch movies on VHS tapes in the 90s, in the early 90s. And I remember one day when my sister was gone and I would sneak into her room and find her, our, her forbidden music and her forbidden movies. I remember I watched The Terminator as a child and it terrified me. The idea of a robot looking like a human being sent from the future to eradicate humanity was just absolutely terrifying. But I remember the scene. It was the scene that put Arnold Schwarzenegger on the map. I mean, literally, it's what, like, what made the Terminator become immortal in, in the movie history. It's the scene of Arnold, the T-800 robot sent from the future to kill Sarah Connors, the mother of John Connor, so that the future doesn't unfold the way it unfolds. And there she's hiding. Sarah Connor is hiding in the police station. And Arnold Schwarzenegger walks in in the movie, or the sound is like, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. That Terminator, ominous Terminator soundtrack. And he's got his sunglasses on and he looks at the sergeant behind the police desk and he's like, I'm here to see Sarah Connors. I'm a friend of hers. And the police officer looks up from rioting. And he's like, well, she's busy. She's spending some time with the police. So you're gonna have to sit and wait. It'll be a couple of hours. And in that moment, Arnold looks around, looks at the police station, the music, dun, 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 dun. And he looks at the guy and he says the famous line. I'll be back, right? You know what I'm talking about? And then the very next scene, if you haven't seen Terminator, sorry, I'm blowing it for you, but the very next scene, he drives a car through the police station to get Sarah, and then he kills everybody. It's a crazy, crazy movie. I remember how scared I was of the Terminator after the movie. I remembered why my parents told me as a kid, don't watch this movie. The funny thing is the reason I say the, the, what, the line of the Terminator and when I bring back the memory of Arnold Schwarzenegger and what that brings to me as a child of the story of this robot sent from the future in this famous movie line, I'll be back, is because many times we have the same sentiment about the paraphrase of Jesus' promise, I'll be back. I mean, when we think about the return of the Lord, and when we think about Jesus' return as we see it in Scripture, oftentimes the story is always accompanied with things like judgment, terror, fire, burning. We get the pictures from movies and from literature of like airplanes falling out of the sky and cars piling up on interstates and the world around us burning to the ground and people are looking for their missing loved ones and it's just chaos upon chaos upon chaos. And when we think about the return of the Lord, we feel a little bit uncomfortable, almost like the T-800 is coming back for us. But the truth of the matter is, the return of Jesus Christ isn't something that we should be afraid of, isn't something that we should fear, isn't something that we should have the hairs on the back of our neck stand up when we think about Jesus' promise to return. We think, ooh, like he's coming back, like, oh no. But rather, it's an encouragement because this is exactly what Paul's going to show us in the church is that the promise of Jesus Christ's return, while it does come with judgment, while it does come with fire, while it does come with, with all sorts of different things, the return of Jesus Christ is not something out of the Terminator movie. Rather, it is something straight out of the, the, the heart of heaven for each and every one of us. And I wanna show you that in scripture today. And that's what we're picking up today. So right after Paul the Apostle instructs the church, this is what life in Jesus should look like. Now he gives them the bit of encouragement of what Jesus' plan for the church is. And we're gonna pick that up today in 1 Thessalonians chapter four. So if you've got a Bible, go with me and let's read this together. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to finish chapter 4 today. And then after this, we've only got two more weeks in the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's hard to believe it. It just goes so fast, but there's so much good stuff. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, we're going to start in verse number 13, and we're going to continue through all the way through the end of chapter number 4 today. But I'm going to stop. We're going to explain some things, and we're going to look into some depth and some detail of what God is teaching us through Paul's writing. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says it like this in verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed. I've got that highlighted for you, uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. We're gonna pause right there. See, Paul is talking about something. He's just finished talking about what life in Jesus looks like, but now he's talking about what life after life looks like. And he says, listen, I don't want you to be uninformed. That word uninformed is the word ignorant. It's the word uneducated or uninitiated. Paul's saying, I don't want you to be in the dark. I don't want you to live in curiosity or in the question about what happens to those who have gone before us. See, when he says the word fall asleep, he's not talking about taking a long nap. He's not talking about comas or anything like that. When Paul is talking about fall asleep, it's the way that in Paul's day and age, people would discuss death. So in other words, Paul is saying, I don't want you to be uneducated. I don't want you to be curious. I don't want you to feel like you don't know what happens to people when they die. Because he says, we have a hope. And that I don't want you to mourn, Paul says, like those who have no hope. See, he's not saying that we shouldn't mourn or that we shouldn't feel grief or that we shouldn't feel sadness when those who are close to us die or those who are close to us move on in life. Why? Because that is a part of humanity. God gave us emotions. Sometimes as a pastor, I'll see scriptures and, and, or, or people as in the course of their life, they'll come back to this scripture after they've lost somebody and they're trying to hold on. They're trying not to show any grief. They're trying not to show any sorrow. They're trying not to show any emotion for the loss of a loved one. But here it's not saying don't grieve. That's not what Paul's saying. Jesus himself blessed us in his Beatitudes, his Sermon on the Mount. And he said, blessed are those who mourn. God gave us these emotions. But what Paul is instructing us, the church, is that it's not a grief of, of, of hopelessness, as though death is final, as the grave is the last part of our life. Paul is saying there is something more. There is hope in front of us. And that is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of Jesus is always a message of hope. Peter says it like this. Peter's one of Jesus's best friends. He was one of Jesus's inner circle. And when he traveled with Jesus, he heard, he heard things from Jesus that few others heard because Peter was always there. And Peter reminds the church and he says, it, he says this to the church. He says, listen, it's gonna get tough. The world is going to be hard. Life is difficult. There's gonna be hardships and persecutions and people are gonna come and people are gonna go. And he says that life is difficult. And he says, with that in mind, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, Peter says, with that in mind, therefore, we prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded, clear thinking. And we set our hope, here it is, fully on the grace that will be brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, what Peter is saying is what Paul is saying. There will be days and there will be times and there will be areas in our lives where it feels like there's no hope. It feels like things are difficult. It feels like our soul has been ripped out of our chest or, or our world is going to hell in a handbasket. And in those times, the message of hope is not a political system. It's not an ideology. It's not a religion. It's the message of Jesus Christ. And Peter says it like this, that will be brought to you, delivered to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This isn't on the screen, but Paul writes about this in Romans chapter five. He says, this is the hope that we have, that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. And even though we have difficult times, those difficult times produce in us a hope of Jesus Christ that does not disappoint. We have a phrase here at Journey that we say all the time. Some people think it's our mission statement, but it's actually not our mission statement. It's just kind of like a catchphrase. And we say it like this. We say, hope for everyone. Like if you ever get coffee, bam, it's right there in neon, right in front of you as you're getting coffee here in the location. Why? Because we believe that this is the message of Jesus, that in Jesus Christ, there is hope for everyone. 
And Paul is reminding us that, listen, people are gonna come, people are gonna go. People are gonna go before it's their time. We're gonna feel like there's a sense of mourning, there's a sense of loss in our lives, but we don't have to go through each and every day wondering if there is hope for our future or for the future of our loved ones in Jesus Christ because Paul tells us there is hope that is revealed in Jesus Christ. This is what we get to have. This is the truth that we have. He goes on and he says these words, and this is part of the argument that he builds for this hope in Jesus. He says now in verse number 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So this is the first time we begin to see the, the, the return of Jesus Christ. And that when Jesus returns, he says that, the, that God will bring with Jesus those who have died and who have gone before us. They will return with Jesus. But he says something very important that I want to key in on for just a moment. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. See, that word believe today is a very different word than it was in Paul's day and age and in the church as they read that. You see, in the way that we see believe today, we think of believe as like a positive thought, like a wishful attitude or, a, you know, like I'm gonna hold on to that. That's good. I'd like, to, I'd like for that to happen, so I believe it's gonna happen. The word that Paul uses here is the same root word for what we get the word faith. It's the word pisteo or pistis in the Greek language. And that means belief, of persuasion, a firm persuasion. It means a conviction based upon what we have heard. And so what Paul is saying is, listen, we are not just, you know, hoping. We're not just lightly thinking. We're not just thinking like that would be the good. I hope it all pans out or I hope it all works out. Paul is saying, we are convinced that Jesus Christ died and was raised again. And because of the resurrection of Jesus, this is the guarantee of the promise. Because of what the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives to each and every one of us, we know this, that God will bring those who have fallen asleep with him when he returns. This is the promise of God. This is the hope that we have for the lost loved ones that we have experienced, that we will see them again. Now, the thing about this is that there's something amazing of what Paul says. He says, we believe in the power of the resurrection. We believe in the event of the resurrection. This is the hope for each and every one of us, that God would do something in our lives. Paul writes it like this in Romans chapter 8. He says about this, and I, I love this verse. I claim this verse over me all the time. He says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Right there, that's huge. I mean, think about it for a moment. Today is the day of Pentecost. We're thinking about the, the birth of the church as we see it in the book of Acts. But really, a couple of weeks previous, we celebrated Easter not too long ago. Easter is a celebration of the greatest event in all of history. Why? Because it's the resurrection of Jesus. But think about it for a moment, the resurrection of Jesus. See, Jesus on several occasions resurrected other people. Jesus, I think back to the story of Lazarus when he resurrected Martha and Mary's brother, Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days from the grave. Jesus stood out of the grave, outside of the grave, and he called, Lazarus, come forth. The story of the resurrection is not like the story of the resurrection of Lazarus because nobody was standing at Jesus' grave. There was nobody better. There was no stronger or greater prophet or teacher. There was nobody on the outside of Jesus' grave calling him out from the dead. As a matter of fact, the only people who were hanging out outside of Jesus' grave were Roman guards that were positioned there to make sure nobody came out of that grave. But yet, it wasn't somebody calling Jesus out. It was the power of God that started within the grave, within Jesus, that the Spirit of God brought Jesus back to life after the third day. And that stone was rolled away. And those Roman guards that were there to ensure nobody came out of that grave, they got knocked down off their feet and they fell down on their faces like they were dead because of the power of God. And now in that story, now that story, Paul reminds you and I that it is the very same power of God that lives on the inside of each and every one of us, that brings life to our bodies. Praise God for that one. I love that one. You know, I'm getting to that threshold in life where I feel like I'm, cre I'm crossing over the bell curve of life. Like all of a sudden, I feel like it's no, longer an, uh, it's no longer an uphill battle. It's like downhill, like gravity's working hard. 
I, I got to a place now where like I see only in standard definition. I can only hear certain frequencies and it just so happens to be the frequencies to which my wife and my kids talk on a regular basis. I just don't hear them anymore. And, and now all of a sudden I get up and my body is stiff and my kids are like, dad, what'd you do? And I'm like, I sneezed. <laughs> but I thank God for Romans 8, 11, on the days where my back feels a little sore, where my eyes feel a little blurry, where I remember that God is bringing life to this body. But not just life to this body as in like every day, life to this body in the resurrection. See, there is a promise here that in Jesus Christ, if you are not alive when Jesus Christ returns, you are coming back with Jesus Christ resurrected. That gets a little bit creepy though. Let's be honest, because for a moment, we start to ask the question like, wait, what does resurrection look like? Because I don't know about you, but I noticed about our culture and our world today that we have kind of become obsessed with zombies. We love zombie movies. We love those type of movies where the walking dead are coming out and everybody's like some virus turns people into zombies. And when I, I'll just, be, I'll just confess to you, when I think about resurrections, somewhere in my imagination, I go back to like the dark foggy nights of something out of Tales from the Crypt when an old headstone's there and like the skeleton punctures through the ground and people are like pulling out. That's what I think of when I think of resurrection from the dead. But then I think about when Jesus comes and a bunch of like deteriorated bodies or zombies walking on the earth. And I think that is not something I want to stick around to see. Some of you in this place have special ammunition just to kill those zombies should they arrive. <laughs> but that's not at all the case. Because you see, we have asked the question for, for, for centuries, literally millennium. What will the resurrection be like? If Jesus Christ promises that if we die before he returns, that we will come back with him, what does that resurrection look like? What does it, what is coming back from the dead look like? Because honestly, that's a little creepy to think about. But guess what? You're not alone in thinking that. That's not a new, new question. Zombies are not a new fascination with just our culture in our day and age. Even in Paul's day, they understood that when you buried somebody in the ground, it did not take very long for like stuff to start happening to them. And so they even asked the question, Paul writes about it and he answers the question. I'm gonna show it to you in, in 1 Corinthians. I'm gonna read it out of the New Living Translation just because it's a little bit easier way to read what Paul is writing. It doesn't take as much explanation to say what Paul is saying in our modern day vernacular. But Paul says it like this. Some ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? That's like somebody saying, will they be zombies, Paul? I love how Paul tries to set everybody's mind at ease. Like, good question. You know, if somebody says like, there's no stupid questions. No, Paul's like, wrong. What a foolish question. <laughs> Not gonna be zombies when Jesus returns. And then he begins to explain it. And here's what he says. He says, listen, it's like a seed that's put into the ground. It doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. He goes on and explains it a little bit more and then we'll, we'll kind of bring some light to what he says. And he says, listen, and what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. So what Paul is saying right here, I say, listen, we understand this with, 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 with agriculture. When you put a seed into the ground, it's not the seed that comes back out of the ground, it's the plant that comes out of the ground. So the seed stops existing and dies, breaks open, and out of the seed comes the plant. But what is coming out of the ground is a likeness of what was in the ground. So for example, this is basic science. I think you could get this. If you plant a sunflower, what will grow? Sunflower. Good job. <laughs> you guys are so smart. If you plant a tomato seed, what will grow? Tomato. Yes, you guys are so good. So good. So what Paul is saying is, listen, it's not the seed that comes out of the ground, it's the plant. So when our bodies are laid to rest, it's not our body that comes back out because that's dust, grime, dirt, and some nastiness. It's the likeness of what was placed in there. Some people have wondered over the years about even cremation, like, oh no, if I cremate somebody or if something happens like that, like, and I don't bury them all together, will their body come? Listen, God is not reconstituting you when you resurrect from the dead. That's not the condition, it's a resurrection. Paul says it, he goes a little bit more in elaborate in detail and he says it like this in verse number 42. He says, in the same way with the resurrection of the dead, 
Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die. But when they, but they will be raised to life forever. Our bodies, he says, are buried in brokenness, but they are raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. This is all pointing to our power versus God's power. He says they are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are spiritual bodies. Now, this gets a little bit confusing because some of us are like, so what, are we like ghosts or what does that mean? Jesus explained this really well to Nicodemus and we get the famous verse out of John chapter three, verse 16 out of this conversation. When Nicodemus approaches Jesus and he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life that you talk about? Jesus' answer is, you must be born again. Now, in that moment, Nicodemus takes a step back, scratches his head, looks at Jesus with the utmost of confusion and says, what do you mean by that? That I'm supposed to go back to my mother, crawl back up and then come back out again? I can imagine Jesus like, dude, what kind of imagination takes you there? That's crazy. No. He says these words, Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. And he uses the illustration. He says, you know the wind exists, yet you don't know where it comes from and you cannot see it, but you can feel its effect. This is like the spiritual world. See, the thing that bakes my noodle every time I try to figure this out is that there is a world that is more real than the real world that we're living in today. I know, right? That's a lot to think about. But think about this for a moment. Before any of this existed, there was something that still existed, God. And we see this in Genesis chapter one, that God said, let there be light. Boom, right? All of a sudden there's light. A couple of days go later, God, later, God says, let there be a sun and a moon. Boom, the sun and the moon. Let there be a planet. Boom, let the, let the continents and the water be divided from each other. Boom, all of a sudden God speaks into physical existence what did not exist before God said something. Which means the world that we live in, the world that is driven by our taste, our touch, our sight, our hearing is, is now not driven by what God moves. See, God is, is, is in a world, the spiritual world is more real. It existed before our world existed. And according to the revelation and the return of Jesus Christ and to God's eternal plan, the spiritual world will exist after our physical world ceases to exist, which means that is a far more real place than this place. And this is what Paul is saying. The resurrection is not a place for you to live or for your bodies to come back just in the tangible world to which we live, but now into the spiritual world of which God is bringing to reality at the return of Jesus Christ. So I really hate to pop your bubble. There's not gonna be a zombie apocalypse with Jesus' return. Some people are like, dang, I was really hoping for that. Nope, not happening. Some people might even say with this idea that the dead will come with, a, with Jesus. Some people have said, and I've experienced this, and many of you have experienced this before, of, of loved ones that have gone before their time. We wonder and we ask the question, God, why did you allow that to happen? God, why didn't you intervene or why didn't you stop when we see young people that have died, when we see people that, have, that were taken away from us in tragedy or some unexpected form or fashion of death and we wonder what happened, they had more life to give. We even use the phrase often in our society and in our world today that we have lost someone that we love. But you see, the hope of this message that Paul is telling us about the return of Jesus is that they're not lost. Those who are in Jesus Christ, they're not lost because you cannot lose that which you know where it is. That's the hope of Jesus, that when we die and when we follow Jesus Christ, we know where we stand. People all the time are wondering and asking, well, what happens? Or what if I miss it? Or what if, it's, what, if it's, what, if I, what if I'm not right in that moment? We will talk about that, I promise, at length. But here's the promise that even those that you feel like you have lost, that maybe we don't have the answer to the question right now as to why God allowed that to happen, we will be reunited with them in the return of Christ. That is good news. That is amazing news. And Paul tells us that and he gives us a little bit more of insight because he says these words. He says, listen, verse number 15, we declare to you by a word from the Lord. In other words, God has told us this, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who've fallen asleep. 
We who are alive will not go before those who have died. See, sometimes people like to think, well, you know, maybe people who die, like their soul goes into a slumber or there's kind of this neutral ground or there's a place that you go to that's not quite in the presence of God yet where you've got to work everything out. And then when Jesus comes back, it's all settled. And then everybody comes back on a level playing field. Nowhere do we see any of that in scripture. Here's what Paul is saying, because people in those days used to believe that when you died, your soul ceased to exist. So those who were alive were, were further along in the will of God than those who were dead. But Paul's saying, listen, it's not that way. It's actually the opposite. Those who have died before us are already with Jesus. They're coming before we are. They're a part of the parade. They're a part of the return. This is the will and this is the understanding of God when we ask what happens to us when we die. The Bible is very clear on that. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, listen, I would much, much rather not be alive right now. This is what he says. Life is hard. It's difficult. And he says, I would much rather not be alive right, here, right now. Why? Because to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. If I'm not present in this earth suit that I would call a body, then my soul is with Jesus when I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. Here's another verse for you. Let me show you this about where we go and what happens to us when we die, when our faith and our trust is placed in Jesus. On the very death of Jesus Christ, on that cross, that rugged cross on Calvary, Jesus was flanked on each side by two thieves. One of the thieves mocked Jesus and told him if he was really who he said he was, that he should raise himself from the dead, that he should be what everybody says he is and save everybody and those who were on the cross. The other thief on the other side of Jesus didn't mock Jesus, but rather defended Jesus. And he told the other thief, we have deserved the death that we have, but this man is innocent and good. And then, and then that thief says to Jesus with some of his dying breath, he says, would you remember me when you die? That's it. Remember me. But Jesus' response isn't, well, someday when you're rejuvenated, when everything happens, it'll all work out. Jesus' response to the thief that simply asked, would you remember me? Jesus says in Luke chapter 23, he says, assuredly, I say to you today, not tomorrow, not after the millennial reign, not in a thousand years, not in a million years, not after whatever else happens. Jesus says, today, you will be with me in paradise. See, this is the hope of glory that if we die, we know that we move on to the next place in life and that next place in life is with Jesus Christ. Death is not final. The grave is not the last stand of our lives. There is something more to our lives that has to do with Jesus Christ. And that is the hope of our future. You know, I think about it. I've got, uh, I've got an 11-year-old son, a 9-year-old daughter, and now I've got a 2-year-old son, my, my little baby boy, Soren. He's so much fun. I love this age. It's just so stinking cute. I'll be honest. I liked one a little bit better than I liked two because one was like the incontinent baby that didn't really do anything but coo and cry. Now he's a terrible toddler. But I still like how terrible toddlers can fall asleep anywhere. It fascinates me. I mean, he could be laying on the dirt and he's tired enough, he will fall asleep. Wood chips, this is, I'm telling you from experience, wood chips buried into the side of his face because that was the time for a nap. But you know what's really cool about that? Is he takes these naps and sometimes he crashes in really odd or weird places. But the thing is, is that he doesn't wake up in the dirt with his face on the ground. He wakes up in his bed. He wakes up in his place. He wakes in a spot that's comfortable, that, that's unique to him, that he knows is his place. Why? Because dad or mom saw him and moved him while he was there. See, friends, that's what death is for you and I. So often we're afraid of death. We fear death because we don't know the unknown. We're not sure of the uncertain. But death is simply a transition. It's a transition from this world to the next. Like a toddler falling asleep and waking up in the bedroom, we fall asleep in our soul and in our lives. And the moment we gain reconsciousness, now we are in the presence of Jesus Christ. This is the hope of our faith in Jesus. This is why it's a good news. It's not something to be afraid of. It's not something to fear. It's not something to cower at, that we have hope. Paul goes on and he says these words, and the promise of Jesus in verse number 16 is that the Lord himself 
will descend from heaven. This is the return of Jesus. With a cry from, of command, with a sound of the voice of the, of the archangel, his name is Michael, and the sound of the trumpets of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. They will come to meet him. They will come with him on the parade. This is the loudest day in all of history, the return of Jesus Christ. Christ. This is it, the promise of the return of Jesus Christ. It says, that, it says that they will go and they will meet him. Now, verse number 17, Paul says, but we who are alive, we who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. That word caught up is the word that we get the concept today for the word that's not actually in the Bible, but it's a very good word for it. And it's the word rapture. The word caught up there is the Greek word harpazo. And that word harpazo means taken away or caught away. And so what this is saying is that this is the picture of the rapture. Now, many of us get the picture of the rapture. And that's what I was talking about the doomsday where a pilot's flying a plane and Jesus returns and bam, the plane falls out of the sky. Somebody's driving a car. I've seen those, I've seen those bumper stickers like warning upon rapture, this, this car will be re- empty. You know, like, like no, the, like the car will be gone and everything's gone. Like that's the rapture. And then all that's left is the world, for the, the world to burn. But as a picture of that might be, and maybe so we get the idea from like things like the Left Behind series and what that looks like, there's actually something more being said here than just we're zapped away from our existence here on earth and now we're in heaven and everything's good and everything's peachy and everything's hunky-dory because there's actually something to be said about what is, what is communicated right here. Because it says we will be caught up together So Jesus is coming down and we who are alive will be caught up with Jesus in the sky. But it says to meet him in the air, to meet him in the air. That word to meet him is only seen in scripture three times, the way it's described, to meet him in the air. And see, most of us would think the rapture is to take us out of this God awful place and go to heaven. But that's not what the word to meet him means. The word to meet him signifies I am doing my thing. I get the news. I stop doing what I'm doing and I go do something else and I go where that thing is. That's basically what to meet him means. It's used here in 1 Thessalonians. It's used once in the book of Acts when Paul says, I'm gonna go meet you in Rome. And it's used one other time in a great parable. And that's the parable of the virgins, the parable of the wedding. And so Jesus describes it. He says, there are 10 virgins. 10 young ladies that are preparing for a wedding. It's amazing that even thousands of years ago, weddings never started on time. Every time I do a wedding for somebody, they're always like, you know, the wedding planner's like, we're gonna be the ones that start on time. I'm like, (laughs) I've like never seen one start on time yet. This is exactly the classic case of a wedding. It never starts on time. The bridegroom, the, the, the groom gets delayed. And because it gets delayed, the oil in their lamps to keep them illuminated at night so that they can see where they're going starts to run out. The story is a story of preparedness because some of them have brought extra oil just ready for that. You can equate that today. The batteries in their flashlights are dying. Some of them brought extra batteries. They brought one of those little clamp-on magnetic chargers that you can throw on the back of your phone, keep it running for another day. That's what they had. And as the bridegroom comes, those who were going out missed the story. Why? Because it happened in a moment. But here, that same conversation, that same word, to meet him, like Paul says about meeting Jesus in the clouds, is a story here. And it's like this. It says that at midnight, verse number 26, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. You see, it's not come out to meet him and be vaporized or be vanished from the world. It's to go from where you were waiting, from where you were sitting, from being in the position of slumber or of waiting to get up and to go meet him where he is and then come back with him to the wedding. The story of Revelation tells us about a wedding feast and the return of the Lord. Some people believe that Jesus will come, take the church away, and then all of the hardships will happen to the world. And then Jesus will come back and, and, and condemn the world like a third return. And there's a lot of debate about that. Some people love to argue, and it's called eschatology. They love to argue and debate. It's going to be like this, and it's going to be like that, and it's going to be like this, and it's going to be like that. Here's what we know, that Jesus will return, and he will call us to him. Either we will be dead and will before, and we will come with Jesus in the parade of the return and the triumphant return, or if we are blessed enough to be alive in that moment, we will stop what we were doing, and we will meet Jesus on the parade, on the return, and we will return to this place with Jesus. That's that's good news. 
that either way, we get to be with Jesus. See, that's the heart of this. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, at the end of this, he says, listen, encourage one another with these words. See, the return of Jesus shouldn't be the story of I'll be back. Like, you better get ready. You don't know, like turn or burn. Like, oh my goodness, it's happening. Like the T-800's coming back and his name's Jesus. No, that's not it. The story of the return of Jesus is a triumphant return. That those that we've missed and those that we mourn and those that, we have, that have gone before us, they're coming back in the parade. And we, if we're blessed enough to be alive, to experience it in the moment, we will be caught up with that parade to come back with the bridegroom for the great wedding feast of Jesus' return. That is the good news. That's why it's an encouragement. It's an encouragement that our best days have yet to come that our future is bright in Jesus Christ. Whether we die and don't see it or whether we're alive and the return happens, we know that we get to be with Jesus. Because in the end, Jesus will either bring us with him or come for us. But either way, we get to be with Jesus. That's the promise. That's the promise of all things. And so we call them the end times. And we wonder, is this the end times? But friends, really, it's not the end times. It's actually the beginning of the times because it's now in this moment that we're caught up with Jesus, that we're rejuvenated, that we're resurrected, that we see the authority of Jesus's kingdom of heaven be revealed to the world around us. This is now the moment in history when what Jesus said would come to pass has come to pass in either way. When we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we get to be with him and see it happen. That's good news. That's good news. But the problem is for many of us, even people after the first service, they came after the outdoor and they just said, but how will we know? How, how, do, we, how do we get ready for this? How, how will we be, be prepared for when that day comes? I'll tell you my personality type. I go through so much mental exhaustion trying to figure out what to say, what to do, what, to, what scenario is going to unfold when somebody's like, hey, can I meet with you? I think to my head, they're gonna say this and I'm gonna say that, or they're gonna say this and I'm gonna say that, and they're gonna say this and I'm gonna say that. And I try to figure out every possible scenario so that way I could walk into that meeting or I could spend that time with that person prepared for anything that would come at me. So you know the reality is, as much as we want to be prepared for the return of Jesus, we'll never fully know when that day comes. I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems like today and nowadays more and more, it's like anytime there's a blood moon, it's like, here it is. Anytime there's like a war or something going on, it's like, this is it. Anytime there's like, you know, we just got off two years or I guess we're still in it, but two years of this, you know, this virus and it's like pestilence and famine, like it's now. Friends, for thousands of years, the church has done that. And we can get so anxious and we can get so wrapped up and we can get so caught up and, and trying to figure out all of the signs of the times. And the Bible does say that we will see the signs of the times. And I do believe we are in those times. But is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it 100 years from now? We don't know. The only thing Jesus tells us about timing is this. But when it comes to the day and the hour, he says, no one knows. Not even the angels of the sun, only the Father. See, when God and His sovereignty decides that this is the moment for my will to be unfolded, it will happen. So then that leaves the question, well, how do we prepare? What do we do to prepare? How do we get ready for the return of the King? And to answer that question, you'll have to come back next week. Because <laughs> that's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But today, don't let the idea of the return of Jesus with our faith and our trust in Jesus be something that weighs us down or causes us fear or grief or anxiety. It should be something that we, like the story of the, of the wedding feast, that we should be anticipating the celebration of God's plan unfolding for our lives. But so often we've allowed culture, we've allowed our ideas, and we've allowed our own imaginations to some extent to dictate the narrative of what this looks like. Friends, God's message always, for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, is always a message of hope. Your best days have yet to come. The glory days aren't back in the day when you didn't have to adult like you had to adult, and you didn't have to work like you had to work, and you didn't have the responsibilities that you had. Those aren't the glory days. The glory days are still in front of us 
in the power of Jesus Christ. And that, like Peter says, time will get tough, but let's fix our eyes and our hope on the revelation of grace that will come with Jesus Christ. Keep our eyes peeled because God's on the move. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. Just thank you for this opportunity that we have to be encouraged by your plan that we're not here forgotten. God, that those who have gone before us aren't empty somewhere or in some void or vacancy of existence. But God, I pray for those that have put their faith and their trust in Jesus. God, I thank you that they are there in your presence. And God, I pray that for those of us who are here on this earth today, striving day in and day out to make this existence of life matter, that you would equip us and show us through your Holy Spirit what your plan is for our lives. Like the Psalmist David said, to teach us to number our days, O oh God, to know that you have a plan that involves us for our future and for eternity. And God, thank you that you would set in our hearts a sense of peace and excitement and anticipation that when you return, all will be settled in the name of Jesus. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just a few moments, we're gonna dismiss. We'll let you out and let the traffic jam ensue. But before we do, I don't want you to leave yet. I don't want you to get up and walk around or even try to rush to the bathrooms just yet. They'll be there when you leave, I promise. I want you just to take a moment right now just to think about what does this mean for each and every one of us? Because this promise of the future in Jesus Christ isn't a promise to every person because that's what it is. It's a promise to every person, like Paul said, to every person who believes in Jesus. Like Jesus has the answer, and I told you that story earlier of Nicodemus, of what it takes to inherit this eternal life that Jesus teaches us about. It's all about this idea of belief, but it's not belief as in a good thought or a fairy tale. It's a belief in action in that we would take our lives, our will, our ways, and we would surrender those over to God and we allow God to hold us in His hands with His will, His desire, His plan for our lives. And that only comes by putting our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. We don't achieve this by religion. It doesn't come by church attendance. It doesn't happen because we do good things and hopefully our good outweighs our bad. It happens solely through the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus said these words. He said, He is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one goes to the Father except through Him. Paul the Apostle writes about Jesus, and he says that no one finds Jesus except through the Holy Spirit. I believe even today that God has been drawing you, beckoning you, inviting you into something deeper, something greater, something more meaningful than the life that most of us have just been living to exist, but rather a life of purpose that spans beyond our time here on earth and into our time with Jesus Christ. And that life comes when we give ours to Jesus in the great exchange. See, the great exchange already happened. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus died for our sin and our shame and our regrets and our wrongs. And it was settled on that cross. But in the resurrection of Jesus Christ now, it was celebrated that there was life ahead of us. And so Jesus took our sin and our shame on the cross and in exchange, He gave us the life of the resurrection to live each and every day. And perhaps you're in this place today and you haven't experienced what that life feels like. Maybe you've been living your own ways instead of God's ways, doing your thing instead of God's thing. Maybe you've been living a, a sense of religion more so than a relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, I believe that this is the moment, this is the time that God wants you to not live in religion or rules, but in a relationship with Jesus. So I want you to do, a favor, do me a favor, do yourself a favor for just the, the final moments of the service. Would you just simply close your eyes for just a moment? We're not secret, we're not, bow, we're not, we're not doing anything that, that we don't want you to see. Just want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. You see, closing your eyes is shutting out everything around you. Bowing your head is just a, is a position of introspection and reverence. Would you just ask this question right now? Be open and honest for the answer. And ask this question, God, what are you asking of me? Is God asking of you to give up something, to repent of something? Perhaps He's beckoning you or calling you out into faith into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ to leave religion and ceremonial ritual behind, but to find life in Jesus. If so, would you respond to that invitation? See, God's not a manipulator, a conniver. He's not gonna kick, his door, kick the door over your heart open or force his way in your life. You have been given control of your own life. So would you receive that invitation of life in Jesus Christ? 
If so, today I want to pray with you. A prayer of dedication. A prayer accepting and receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, it's not an abracadabra magical formula that makes the change. It's the action of faith accepting what God is doing on the inside of you. And if you're in a place today where you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today I want to pray with you. Perhaps you've been living your way instead of God's way. You've been running from God instead of to God, but yet you feel like this pulling in your heart that God is drawing you into something deeper, back into a relationship with Him. If that's the case, I want to pray with you today. And in these final moments, I just want to know who I'm praying with. So here's what I'm going to do. In this moment of introspection between you and God, I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll just go like this. I'll go three. And if that's you in this place, would you just be so bold as to pop a hand up? You see, what you're doing by the raising your hand is you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. I'm going to give my life over to Jesus. I just know that God's calling me and asking me to do something and I need to respond today. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll pray together right where you're at. If you're watching online, we'll pray with you right where you are. But I just want to know who I'm praying with today. If God is calling you and beckoning you into something deeper, something greater, something more than this life that you've been living, would you have the faith to respond and say yes to that invitation? If so, when I count to three, you pop a hand up, I'll see it. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see if that's you in this place. Just pop a hand up so I can see it. Yes, I see you. Yes, I see you. I see you back there. I see you. Anybody else in this place? Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. I see those hands. You can put them down. Praise God. All over the auditorium, if you're watching online and God is calling you, this is your moment. This is your time. You can pray as well. And right now I want to invite you. I'm going to give you some words to say, but listen, once again, it's not a formula that you say that gets you right with God. Please don't misunderstand that. It's your heart confessing and repenting of your past and giving your future to Jesus. That's what we're doing in this moment. So as I give you these words, I want you to say them, and I want you to say them in a way that you can hear them. Scripture tells us in Romans that faith comes by hearing, hearing from the Word of God. So I want you to say these words audibly as you say it together. Would you join me in prayer and just say these with me? Say, Father God, thank you for Jesus. Today I accept and I receive the invitation of life found in Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive me of my past, of my sins, and of my regrets. And I give to you my heart, my life, my will, and all of my emotions. And from this day forward, I choose to follow Jesus with everything that I am. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, somebody, let's celebrate that today. It's awesome. Yes. Yes. Listen, what you just did right now is one of the best decisions that you could possibly make. And one of the best things you can possibly do is to tell somebody about that decision. And we would love to be a part of that. We've got a number that we're putting on the screen right now, 541-625-46. If you just text the keyword life, we would love to follow up with you. Pray with you if you need prayer. Just let you know that, we listen, you did not arrive at your destination. You started a journey. And we want you to know you are not alone on that journey. We'd love to come alongside of you and walk that journey with you together. And we just want you to know we celebrate you. We love you. We're so grateful that you have made that decision. And I know this, friends, in that prayer, that the best is yet to come in Jesus Christ. Well, would you stand to your feet? The band's gonna lead us out. It's not time to make that mass exodus yet. I promise, I promise. Let's spend the last moments in worship to Jesus. As you stand, I wanna leave you with a couple of quick announcements of some things that are happening around Journey, and then we're gonna dismiss right now. First and foremost, for those of you that are going into youth from, from fifth to sixth grade, if you're coming into sixth grade, not this Wednesday, next Wednesday, our youth is hosting kind of a graduation night for, for sixth graders and ninth graders coming into those grades. They're having a Nerf night. They bought a bunch of Nerf bullets, bring a Nerf gun. They got some candy, some glow lights. They're going to shoot each other up and have a party. And we want to invite those who are coming into sixth and coming into ninth grade to come and have fun at our Nerf night. Guys, where's my dudes in the house? Any of the dudes in the place? Come on, we're, give, me, give me a grunt, like a, yeah. Yeah, there it is. All right. That was terrible. <laughs> Guys, listen, in a couple weeks, it's Father's Day. Our men's community, the Saturday before Father's Day, not this Saturday, next Saturday, we've got a special men's community event called Meat and Cornhole Night. All right. They're going to barbecue up some meat, eat some things that are dead, and throw some bean bags into some holes and have community together. I want to invite you to come and hang out, get connected here at church. And lastly, Speaking of Get Connected, we're launching our summer small groups. They're very short, just to hang out. Get to meet somebody here at church. We've got a small group expo right as you exit. Lots of different options for you to, to get connected, to meet somebody here at church. Don't just come in, sit, and leave, because you'll never find community that way. 
when you take the step into action and say, I want to get connected, meet some people, perhaps read a book, talk about the sermon, go golfing, whatever it might be, there's lots of options for you to get connected in small groups here at Journey. That's this week and next week as we do our signups. Finally, I just want to bless you. Pray a prayer of praise over you. Father, I pray for the saints of God that are here tonight. Lord, would you bless them? Would you keep them? And Lord, would you cause your face and your countenance to shine upon them in all that they do? In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's sing one more song. And all the earth will shout your words. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your words. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing.